The topic of this panel is really is uh, something that's called, uh, LinkedIn gave us the, uh, the title, From Compliance to ROI. So if the last session was about compliance, this session is about moving not only from the initial parts of social media, which was how do we make it safe and how do we make it compliant, to actually how do we produce business value. Um, um, so, so with that, the session is going to kind of move, you know, talk about compliance, but also talk about how to get business value from it. And I'd like to introduce uh, our first two guests to talk about this um, from Thrive at Financial. And um, um, let me, uh, uh, let me uh, first introduce uh, Knut Olson, who's the Senior Vice President of the Financial Network. He joined Thriven in 1990, so you know, he's been around here for a little while as a financial representative. Uh, he's moved up quickly through the organization, was the Vice President of Field Distribution for their West Region. And in 2011, he became the senior vice president of the entire financial uh, network. Uh, Knut earned a bachelor degree from Pacific Lutheran University, where he serves now on the Board of Regents. So you were a student, and now you're like the boss. OK. All right. Uh, um, the FINRA guys are still in the, the room. He's, a, uh, he's a registered with a series 6, 7, 24, and 66 licenses, and has his uh, CLU as well. So uh, welcome, Knut, you know, to the panel. Okay. We also have with him uh, Paul uh, Johnson. Paul uh, is Thrivent's Vice President and Deputy General Counsel. Um, in, it, in that position, he leads the legal compliance and support for all corporate services that includes corporate governance, finance, IT, litigation, HR, anything else? Everything except products. <laughs> Great. Prior to joining Thrivent, uh, uh, Paul was Vice President and Group Counsel at American Express, and particularly in the Ameriprise Financial area. And uh, he was pre previously Vice President of Government Affairs for American Express. Um, so welcome, Paul. Great. So um, before I ask you any questions about this, uh, probably Thrivent as a Fortune 500 company probably isn't maybe as well known as everybody. Been so why don't you guys tell us a little bit about your company first? Great. Um, we're uh, the largest fraternal benefits society in the world. So uh, and, and we aren't probably as well known because for the last 110 years, we, we service Lutherans. Um, and we're about to expand that marketplace to Christians, which is going to mean going from about 3% of the U.S. population to 70. Um, and that's a journey we've been on. Uh, but in, in effect, we, we started out as a, as a small life insurer 110 years ago and have um, grown into a, an organization that manages about $90 billion of assets and, um, and has about 2.5 million customers across the country. And um, it... Is for the, for the most part a full services financial service firm now, um, but we stay true to our core and are very missional in nature, um, which is why my title is actually uh, senior vice president of mission advancement. Other places I always say would call it um, distribution, sales, marketing, but uh, we we really do try to stay very focused on differentiating ourselves in the marketplace, trying to help um, U.S. consumers and what we view as a pretty. Um, less than great time for American households in terms of their savings rate, financial choices, et cetera. Um, and so we try to remain very missional about helping people get back on track. Yeah, I think the, the thing I would add when I describe fraternal benefit societies, and um, I had to scratch my head when I was uh, looking to move to Thrive and to, to learn what a fraternal benefit society is, the next largest, and we're probably about three times as big, is Knights of Columbus. Everyone knows what Knights of Columbus is. It's a membership organization that also provides insurance. We're a full-service financial services organization, but at our core, and a lot of the decisions that we made from a compliance and legal perspective are leveraging the unique nature of us being a membership organization first. Great. So um, let's get into social media a little. Um, it may not be widely known, but you guys were early uh, aboard the social media train. And um, I think our relationship started uh, with you guys when you got on that train. Um, and we had to address the compliance issues. And I thought, Paul, maybe you could kind of walk the audience through what were the issues you had to address early on um, um, to get um, on social, uh, both inside the company and outside the company? I think the, the legal and compliance issues we needed to deal with first was mayhem internally uh, in our organization from a legal perspective. We had securities lawyers, we had banking lawyers, we had insurance lawyers, we had uh, advertising lawyers, and everyone was wringing their hands saying, there's not enough guidance. 
and poor Canute and his people in the marketing organization just had some basic ideas they wanted to move forward with. And I observed that we were creating a lot of churn from a legal perspective. I can't stress enough the, f the most important thing we did is I picked one lawyer to be the social media legal expert. Uh, we didn't have any, and, and very few firms had any of that, uh, anyone that developed that expertise. Uh, the comments from uh, my colleague from Goldman is, was, is, is so right on. This is a time where we made an investment at Thrivent in a lawyer. Well, I thought it would probably be 5% of her job. It quickly became about 30, 40% of her job to become an expert in social media law across all of the regulatory bodies and, and, by the way, become as much expert in the regulatory side of the business as the marketing side of the business. I sent her to a number of conferences to, to be able to speak the language that Knut's organization wanted to speak from a marketing perspective and understand it. So we had one point of contact, one point of risk assessment. And oh, by the way, I thought it was interesting that, uh, that Joe used the uh, price in the previous panel from FINRA, used the uh, term uh, principles. Um, and they're in the business of writing rules, but if you look at the guidance that was out there, and by the way, we hopped into social media before there was even that guidance, is you know, it's not really that hard to be a lawyer. I mean, I, I, I don't want to tell you that, but basically, <laughs> basically, you just use good judgment, right? I mean, what are the core principles that we looked at as we were looking to drive into social media? We needed to supervise, we needed to retain, being a broker-dealer, um, and we needed approval. So let's start by just doing that on a very small basis. I mean, before you guys came along with your solution, we were seriously had a small handful of reps uh, doing uh, doing social media for business, and we were doing command print uh, and retaining. And, I, and and my analysis was, if Joe or others came to me and said, "What are you guys doing?" I'm I'm, I'm going to articulate. I'm staying with the core principles. We're far ahead of the regulations, and quite frankly, we always will be on this. And the other thing I had to do is establish expectations with my business partners. Are the rules are changing rapidly? What the advice I give you today? may be different tomorrow. Not only the rules changing rapidly, the functionality in terms of the, uh, the social media uh, environment is changing rapidly. So nimble and focused. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Knut, you've been on the pointy end of the stick out there in the, in the field, both as an individual contributor and up through management. Um, while your counterpart was thinking about social media and the compliance issues, what did you see as the opportunity to actually help clients and help your business? Yeah, so I, I guess my philosophy on any technology solution uh, for anything we do is it's got to accelerate a human process that's already part of the business. And, and in our organization, and uh, most of, I would assume, anyone in retail financial services, new customer acquisition is enormous. Um, and and uh, most advisors today um, ineffectively go to market um, in a, in a really meaningful way, and I think they, they really struggle with their natural market. I mean, if you go to a, any industry conference for advisors, you'll see tons of stuff on referral programs and on building uh, nominator systems and different ways to do new customer acquisition. And actually, social media just felt like such um, a, a no-brainer in terms of just connecting and making relationships. And we're in such a relational business, and all the data suggests, especially the mass affluent part of the marketplace, wants to do business with people that they know, trust, have a relationship with, et cetera. And so I, I would say we didn't overbuild a business case. Um, we did a back-of-the-napkin business case. Um, we took it out of IT's hands as quickly as we could uh, and blew up a project management team in IT and took it back into the business and designated somebody in marketing to own the strategy and to drive it um, and really set a course uh, for business expectations. And when the business took back over, it became less about the technology and it became more about the results. And so we started constructing ideas about what it is that we'd, we'd want to get in terms of early wins that would get us momentum. And I think we've, I think we've seen that. So um, share a little, uh, gentlemen, about uh, how you rolled this out to the field. I, I would imagine you had a few people clamoring to use social media. You had a, probably a few people clamoring 
to not use social media and a bunch of people in the middle. But, you know, Knut, we talked a little bit last night. How do you take a technology like this and roll this out consistently to the field to get maximum business value? Yeah, so, so the first thing, the first mistake we made was we, we tried to roll it out initially to a group of top advisors. Um, and, you know, we met very low adoption with that group. Um, so we rolled it out to 50 people. What we did learn was inside of there, there were probably 10 people that were using it effectively and were motivated. Um, but we only did that for about three months. And then we pivoted our strategy and we opened it up to 200 people. And we made it available to the people who we thought demographically were most likely to be high adopters. We, we did things like, you know, do they have a lot of Facebook friends? Are they already on Twitter and are they tweeting on a regular basis? Do they already have a LinkedIn site that they're not using for business but personally? You know, and so we went and evaluated everybody's own kind of social media activity and we found out that that group of people we could get traction with pretty fast. And so when we rolled it up to the second group of people, we got a really different result. Um, and we got high adoption, high engagement, um, high usage, and, and the hearsay tool actually allowed us to create a pretty slick, simple way for average financial advisors to get live with social media right away. And then we went back to our top advisors and we found key staff people in their office and trained them. And we found out that there was somebody in the right demographic that was a social media user in their practices. And we went back and found the people there that could really lever it up. And from a legal and compliance perspective, what, what we did is uh, from the, from the s- for lack of a better term, a soft, small launch, we learned quite a bit in terms of the process uh, of, of approval of, of the pages, uh, of uh, static versus non-static content, the ability to follow up, uh, and the ability to monitor. And quite frankly, what, what enabled us to launch it on a much more expanded basis, and, and maybe you can later this, is it later this summer, I think we're going to the balance of our field force, uh, was the tools such as Hearsay to enable us to, from a legal perspective, to put broad curbs up and meet the core functionality that we need to from a, a compliance perspective. Yep. Yep. Great. A couple more quick ones here. I'm going to try to keep us on pace and get us out of here at 445 but, um, and get the Putnam people up here. So, um, uh, Paul, in terms of the, there's compliance people in the room here, what advice do you have for them about how to be a partner with the business to drive you know, this forward um, and, and be leaders and press this while at the same time protecting you know, the 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 company as well i mean i i think uh, face the reality that this is here social media is here whether we like it or not from a legal and compliance perspective our 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 sales reps are, are going to be using it so find the best way and the best core principles you can have uh manage your business partner's expectations that the advice you give them is could change quickly uh be have one dedicated person become an expert i can't stress that enough that sped things up and it's an investment that will return some roi in a big way um so be focused and be an expert and be very flexible yeah and last one for you, Knut. Uh, so in the last session with the CMOs over there, I, I heard someone ask this question. They said, can a tweet sell a credit card? Um, so let me ask this one. Can social media help sell all your financial uh, products? Have you seen any early results? How do you measure it? And do you have any success stories to share? Yeah, we are. We're seeing actually surprising amounts of sales. Uh, our cohort that we tested with um, had, was against a control group, was up 22% new customer acquisition over their control group, mostly driven through social media. So we, we saw a real tangible result. Uh, something that I said in the last panel that I'm not sure I actually agreed with in this room was around just the, that, that it's, you know, because of FINRA, we see it's this bar- big barrier to actually be social. But I think we just have to kind of change our mind about what that would look like in a regulated industry. And what I've seen that's really effective, our best users are posting pictures of coaching Little League, and then they're coming up with the hard, hard financial services content that we've canned for them. And then they're showing a picture volunteering at a soup kitchen. And they are blending their social life. And they're showing their brand. And they're building out their social brand. And they're really effective at that. And then what, what we're seeing, I mean, the, the best case we have so far, but this is it's anecdotal, but this is an illustrative of what's happening, is one of our folks next door neighbors never knew what business he was in. He wasn't Lutheran. He wasn't connected to our organization. And um, he saw a Facebook post about some volunteer activities that um, 
that our rep had been in. You know, he'd liked the Facebook page, um, and then he saw this um, this activity, and he literally walked next door and knocked on his door and said, "Hey, um, I'm retiring. I got two hundred thousand dollars that I need to roll over. Can you handle that for me?" And it was just relational. And we we had a few other situations like that where some pretty substantial business is being done. Another one is just real quick. Um, we had a a big. Um, Jostens, who you know, I think they're in the mm-hmm. like rings and that business, right? Uh, and w- was closing a plant down, and the community where that plant closure was, uh, our rep was real social with a bunch of their employees on Facebook, and just posted a, a timely uh, a post around job transition and what do you do when your company gets closed down? Well, it, it ended up getting reposted by. Um, a couple of the employees at Jostens, and they got three phone calls the next day of people wanting to give their transitional 401k money to that rep. And so I think there are definitely applications that we're seeing that are real and meaningful, and we're getting business results. But it's that blend of, of hard-hitting stuff in the business and social, I think. Right. So sales up 22% versus a control group, a bunch of good stories. I think that's a good part to end your session on from compliance to ROA. Thanks very much, gentlemen. And... And let me introduce Joanne back up here to talk with Putnam. Um, hello and welcome. And I'm not Sarah Carter. Um, my name is Joanna Belby. I'm the social media and compliance specialist at Actians. And um, what I, I came to that through really two directions. One, I'm an enthusiastic social media user, a little too much, um, if people tell me. Um, but I also worked at FINRA for a number of years. And at FINRA, what I did was I created educational programs for our member dealers to help them comply with the rules and regulations. So I have a profound respect for compliance, yet I'm real social. So what I do is I help our firms, our clients, deploy social media in a way that's effective, yet compliant. So I'd like to introduce Jamie LaCour of Putnam. Jamie, could you tell a little bit about your background and what you do at Putnam and a little bit about Putnam? Sure. Um, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Putnam first. We're an uh, asset manager. Putnam is one of the oldest mutual fund companies in the country, uh, 75 years old last year. Um, we have three major lines of business, uh, retail mutual funds. We have an institutional business, and we also have a 401k uh, record keeping and uh, plan business. Um, I work in the mutual fund distribution side, and that is where social media lives at Putnam within the broker-dealer mutual fund uh, side, distribution side of the business. And I come at this from a very different place. I was a marketing creative and um, saw an opportunity and pursued it. And we have an extremely supportive and innovative culture at, at Putnam, um, supportive of entrepreneurship within the organization. And that's how we got involved in social, and that's how I wound up here. Okay. You know, before we came, we were talking a little bit, and we are curious, and maybe you can help us. Um, in the room, is anybody still on, with their social media policy of no? No? All right. So you, do you, I would imagine who in the room has a corporate social, social media pro- policy or presence at this point? Yeah? Corporate? Corporate. Um, is anybody use our distributed teams at your firm beginning to use social media yet? A couple? Yeah. Um, has anyone in their firm, have you deployed it? Firm-wide, is it really active? Are you seeing a lot of good returns on investment yet? Any shining stars in the audience? No? I mean, that's pretty much what we're seeing. It's a slow process. It's a, it's a new thing. Financial services um, are slow to adopt. Can you tell me a little bit about your thinking, Jamie, of why you adopted social media? What kind of goals did you have and what you're beginning, you know, what your process has been? Well, we adopted social media because it had been on the plate for a while in marketing, and we um, four years ago, uh, we took on a dynamic new CEO. His name is Bob Reynolds. And um, it was one of his first requests. He's like, I would like for us to have a social media program, make it happen. Um, and that is sort of how we got our compliance people involved. Um, and they sort of the same story as what Paul told. Um, the rules and regulations were already there within the broker dealer. They weren't specific to social media, but they were there. They were spelled out. And our compliance team was very quick to say, we can do this. Um, it's just, like you said, a lot of printing at first. Um, so um, from then, we've, we've grown it uh, in our corporate presence, and now we're working on uh, creating a distributed model and a sort of enterprise-wide social within our sales team. And where we see the next um, phase of this going is to 
enable our sales team to use LinkedIn, Twitter, and maybe eventually Facebook in a compliant manner um, and giving them content that they can use that is also uh, compliant on that side. Can you tell me about the relationship you have with compliance? How are we able to actually move the needle to, to yes? Um, we have a great relationship. We sit 20 feet apart. Um, the whole team is about a team of five in Boston, and there are others in other locations. We work together on a daily basis in marketing already. Mm -hmm. So nothing was new. They weren't strangers to us. Um, and also, when you have a mandate and buy-in from the CEO, um, it changes things a lot. Um, and we're extremely fortunate to have that. Um, he is, I just got an email from him about Warren Buffett. He's very involved. Um, he has given us um, a green light on anything we've ever wanted to do, just about. And um, it makes a very big difference when you have that sort of buy-in. So how does that work exactly? Was he proactively sort of nudging the organization to get social, or did you make a presentation to him? And well, like I said, it was, it was, on, it was on, on the plate. Um, we felt that uh, he, it's something he brought up in early conversations when he started. Okay. Um, the way that we, got about, we went about it was we hired a small firm, a small local firm, a uh, small local agency to sort of walk us through concepts and come up with an initial plan and then execute on the plan. Okay. Now, um, what about analytics? Are you measuring your activities? What type of uh, analytics do you use? Well, another thing that we started around the same time that we started with social was, um, as was said in the, in the session before, we became publishers. We started producing content um, because we had an insatiable need to uh, put content out on social channels, but also because our website needed it. It was, it was the thing to do. Um, at the same time, we started uh, to institute an, uh, a better analytics, or I would say a very deep analytics, sort of data mining of every activity that goes on in every property. So where we've moved to now, and this is new since the fall, is that um, we can trace, you know, did a tweet result in an interaction or feedback, and who is that person, and what sort of assets do they have? And that information then goes into feed um, our predictive model about that person. Um, we are also, we're advisors sold. We sell through intermediaries, so we don't have direct customers. So we have a much smaller uh, base to work with. But we can contribute social data to that predictive model. And um, I believe that that sort of information is, is as good or better than um, looking at other products sold or affinities within a group. So it's. Um, it's very interesting. So what about your distributed teams? Are they excited about this? Do they think it's nonsense? Um, tell me well, it's, a little it's bit about that. It's very different. As an asset manager, we have a captive sales team. So we're not um, dealing with um, an advisor force that is very large. We're looking at something like 125 people. Um, and they, they work for us, and, and they are salespeople. So they're naturally hungry for any kind of opportunity they can um, use to grow their business and their book of business. They, can, they are hungry for any opportunity that will get them a, a meeting. You know, that's sort of their, mm -hmm. one of their KPIs. And what we found with social is that um, not only uh, does a, a social salesperson see better results and, and develop more relationships, but a, a person who understands something like LinkedIn um, can come in and be a mentor to an advisor or a group of advisors mm -hmm. and bring them up to speed and really uh, strengthen that relationship. So we use social as much um, as a value-add service from Putnam mm -hmm. as we do um, a marketing tactic. I see. Now, you mentioned before content. I know that we work with firms, and that seems to be the biggest challenge. I mean, we've been having the conversation around compliance, and then we had the conversation around technology, and it's a pretty well-worn path. At this point, I mean, you have to work through it, but it's, it's not easy, but you have to work through it. But it seems as though the firms I talk to, um, content is the biggest challenge. What are they going to create? Who's going to create it? Can you talk a little bit about that? Who's responsible and what type of bandwidth does it take? And It, it was a challenge at first because we weren't used to it. Um, we are not accustomed to it. We're not accustomed to this sort of constant publishing cycle. Um, by creating channels, specific channels, we, we run four blogs. Um, we have then created something that needs to be done. So if, if that blog isn't updated every week, then you're, you're falling behind. So with, uh, by moving from um, our dot-com as being the center of our universe to thinking of a distributed publishing model as, as what we are, um, that sort of allowed our content creation team to um, have channels to fill and give them uh, specific responsibilities. Each, each blog is very specific. Um, so it's by creating the mediums we were we sort of created the the process. So do you do you leverage other um, 
information content that's in your website, or is it really specifically designed for social? Um, no, we still produce long-form white papers, which are you know a, a still a key thing for a business like ours to do. But what we'll do is, um, and that's been mentioned before, that white paper, we love sharing it on SlideShare. We love embedding it in a blog where we take a snackable bit of content from that white paper and feature it in the blog. That allows me to uh, tweet about it, Facebook it, um, post it on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. and we'll get you know something like one to three um, pieces of snackable content out of a nice long white paper right. that is also there in a blog post on SlideShare. I mean, I don't want to sound like a sales rep for SlideShare, but it's 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 been pretty good to Does us. Everybody know what SlideShare is? Is everyone using it? It's like a plug into LinkedIn. I guess we're at LinkedIn. Everyone would know what that is. Okay. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, it's it's we we are producing still long form content, but we're also producing uh, using that as a, a a jumping off point for producing shorter form content, mm -hmm. and we're also producing short form content specifically for um, uh, consumption on social, for use on our website, and developing tools also that are very uh, promotable and usable by advisors. You know, the people people always ask me about bandwidth when people when firms are just beginning this the social journey like the first question always is even if they don't say it in the meeting they'll say it afterwards they'll say Joanna how many people is it going to take to do this can you give us a sense of the level of effort that it takes to deploy social within the organization sure uh, we brought in initially um, I was sort of doing this on the weekends and at night uh, we brought in a former reporter for from a financial trade journal um, to sort of goose up the level of our uh, editorial team. Um, we leveraged all of the resources that we had already uh, on hand, web developers, web designers, print designers, um, videographers, everyone that we already had on hand in our marketing team, uh, compliance folks, things like that. And over time, we've had uh, two ads to staff. Uh, my job changed, and I have someone working with me. But um, it's very much spread out all over the organization now, and everyone is involved um, on a weekly basis on, in what we do. So it's not siloed. It's, no. It's different people from different groups. It's baked in. That's great. So it means it's really going across the organization. Yes. Because I know we found that we're, uh, one of the recipes for success is not to have social media siloed off to the corner, but really an integrated in your marketing tapestry, which it sounds like that's what you're right. doing. And we're always working on building our competencies. We're always looking at, um, you know, what sort of tweets were effective and what sort of feedback can I give the creative team? What sort of uh, graphics are working better? Um, we had an email discussion going on today while I was here about uh, flat design and, and how we you know, need to sort of be a little more responsive to things like that. So, Can you talk a little bit about what things are successful? Can you share some key learnings? Um, we have, well, Putnam is very focused on the advisor, so the advisor sells our products. So we try to do, um, we try to produce content that is supportive of our relationship with the advisor and helps the advisor do their job. Um, we have a blog that is called Advisor Tech Tips, which is not my first choice of name, but that URL is available. And it's just a very short uh, vlog uh, and also some written pieces, um, just helping advisors like navigate things in LinkedIn, like how to do an advanced search, or mm -hmm. um, is a premium membership worth it? Or um, mm -hmm. we just did one, um, words not to use on Twitter. And things like this. Um, <laughs> like they, guarantee? They, like guarantee. So, and things like that tend to, to really like, take on a life of their own. And, and that last tweet about uh, what not to say on Twitter has done quite well. Um, so um, we focus on the advisor and we, we provide information for the advisor um, in terms of technology, in terms of wealth management topics, in terms of um, our market commentary, and in terms of thought leadership. Okay. Is, there, um, is there anything that you could share, like things that you wish you had done a different way before deploying social um, in the organization? I was involved in the very early stages, then I stepped out, and then I came back. So um, there was a middle ground where I think things kind of got slowly slow. Um, I think that there are some mediums that I, I don't think we've mastered video. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we've um, figured that out yet, and I don't know how that works for uh, asset managers either. Um, I think that we would have maybe not participated in as many networks as quickly as we did um, and taken it a little slower, but... Then again, it's not in our DNA, um, in our marketing culture, or in our company culture to take things slowly. Um, so, so you just went all out at first. Went all out. Right. And no risk. Which is different. A lot of firms to start with one. They'll say they'll start with LinkedIn as a start. Now, Michael, I want to ask you about the time. What time is it? Well, why don't we just uh, take questions? And, yeah. These two Do you have questions? questions you want to come up, up the thriving up. folks? You guys want to come back up? And I think we probably have about five minutes. 
Any questions from anyone? Cornelia. I feel like I know everybody in this whole event today. I, I beg your pardon? I feel like a kid with a can, like in a candy store that I, I just want to talk to everybody. <laughs> Thank you. So. Thank you so much. And to, could you introduce every, yourself and tell you? My name is Cornelia levy Benjiton, and I'm a marketing consultant specializing in financial services and social media. My question is to the gentleman from Putnam, and I don't know if you can answer this question, but it would be great if you can. And the question is, can you help us understand a little bit more about your predictive model? What factors do you include in it to calculate it? Uh, what platforms in social media? How frequently do you update it? Because uh, I haven't heard too many people speaking about their modeling, and I'd love to learn a little bit more if you can share. I can't share. Uh, <laughs> I was afraid of that. <laughs> I can give you a, a, a broad overview of, of what it is. It's, it's a proprietary database. Um, we have an amazing team of analytics professionals and um, who just amaze me on a daily basis. And I work with very closely. Um, just to show, tell you how a piece of social content would get through, everything is, is obviously uh, tagged and coded. Um, we can trace an interaction through the blogs even, which we don't host on our site, or through our own site um, into um, the first level of databases. And then after that, it is matched up with um, a system ID. And if you're a new visitor, um, we will uh, evaluate you after a certain period manually and determine if you are worthy of uh, continuing on as a, a qualified lead. Um, but if you already have a system ID and you're cookied, we will know who you are as you go through the through the system. So if someone tweets at you or retweets some of your content, you can go back and identify if they're a client? Uh, yes. Retweets, yes. Tweets at me, no. Okay. So some functions we can trace, some functions we can't. Um, and as we roll the uh, participation social out to our sales team, we are very excited to see them elevate our content because they are on the front lines actually making the sale. And they're... Uh, contacts are much more a different kind of contact than we have at a corporate level, which is where we are now. So as that richer data comes in, that'll be interesting to um, look at that and also to report it back to them in terms of predictions and leads. But it's we, in its infancy. I think we can take one more before we had you to send you back to the main tent and the wrap up. So, oh come on. Well, it's, it's a smart group. You know, the last group. If you ask the last question to keep the class late, sometimes, We're you know. We're standing between you and the bar, right? All right. Well, I want to I thank our guests. Uh, uh, I want to thank Octians for joining me on this. I want to thank Putnam and, and uh, our two customers from, uh, from Thrive. And thank you very much. Uh, enjoy the last session. And um, uh, we look forward to uh, working with you in the future.